All right, so before we jump into this very special edition Christmas story that Josh is going to read for you, I think it's only fitting that we address this once and for all. A lot of people debate whether or not Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Josh, where do you land on this? Didn't it, uh, wasn't it set d- during Christmas, right? Absolutely, it was set during Christmas. Yeah, holiday party for sure. It's a proper Christmas movie. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I th- but a lot of people have a problem with it. And so I think here we're going to take an official stance as guys who do stuff. Die Hard, Christmas movie. Yeah. And if you missed it this year... We want to just give you a quick recap to the poem Towards the Night Before Christmas from the book Die Hard Christmas. Twas the night before Christmas, and up in the tower, everyone was partying except one wallflower. John McLean missed his wife. Things just weren't the same since Holly had moved west and changed her last name. He tried to win her back, but Still, she said no, while unbeknownst to them, there was trouble below. A truck had pulled up, and who should disembark but fourteen men whose intentions were dark. They spoke not a word and unloaded big crates. They cut the phone lines and locked all the gates. Carl swept the ground floor, shooting every guard dead, while visions of bearer bonds danced in his head. John took off his shoes, making fists with his toes. It actually worked. Well, what do you know? When out in the lobby there arose such a clatter, he sprung to the door to see what was the matter. When what to his wandering eyes should appear? Holy crap! There are terrorists here! John hid under a table where no one could see and watched Hans question Mr. Tagaki. I'm going to count to three. There will not be a four. Give me the codes to open the vault door. I don't know the codes, so go ahead and shoot. Okay, said Hans Gruber and ruined Takagi's suit. John tried to call the cops by pulling an alarm, but instead called the bad guys who tried to cause him harm. But John killed Tony, who had very small feet, and sent him to the terrorists as a yuletide treat. He put a Santa hat on the German, and eyes all aglow, wrote, Now I have a machine gun. Ho, 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 Carl was furious. Tony was his brother. He chased John across the roof, and they shot at each other. John was able to escape through the ventilation shafts. Come out to the coast, he sighed. We'll have a few laughs. (laughs) At Nakatami Tower, Sergeant Powell appeared. He checked the whole lobby and saw nothing weird. He was pulling away but didn't get far before Marco landed on the hood of his car. Powell drove away backwards, screaming in fright. Welcome to the party, pal, John yelled with delight. More police arrived and the FBI and SWAT team, but Hans didn't mind. It was all part of his scheme. More rapid than eagles, his henchmen they came, and he radioed and shouted and called them by name. Now Eddie, now James, now Franco, now Yuli, on Fritz and on Carl, hair long and unruly. They shot the SWAT tank with a surface-to-air missile and knocked it away like the down of a thistle. Now John McLean was angry indeed. He blew up two terrorists and called them jerkweed. Ellis told Hans, Bubby, I'm your white knight. Hans shot him dead, giving the hostages a fright. Hans went to go check on the explosives fuse and saw that poor John wasn't wearing any shoes. John fled from Carl and Hans, but alas, he had to run barefoot over sharp, broken glass. His feet, how they hurt, his soles all so bloody, John crawled to the bathroom and called his good buddy. John was weary and ready to throw in the towel until he got a pep talk from Sergeant Al Powell. Powell was chubby and plump, a right jolly old cop, and he trusted the cowboy and the tattered tank top. But a reporter was probing into McLean's life and revealed that Holly was actually John's wife. Hans quickly flipped over the gold picture frame. It's a pleasure to meet you. Mrs. McLean. His clothes all tarnished with ashes and soot, John staggered to the roof, bloody and barefoot. The explosives were wired to the rooftop with care in hopes that the hostages would soon be there. 
John warned everyone the roof would soon blow as the chopper strafed him with high-powered ammo. Around his waist, he tied a fire hose tight and, screaming on oath, jumped into the night. He dangled in the air and gritted his teeth while flames encircled the tower like a wreath. Fiercely fighting his way back inside, John yelled out, Hans! He was done trying to hide. He limped to the vault like an old man on crutches, only to find Holly in his filthy clutches. John dropped his gun, put his hands on his head. It seemed he and Holly soon would be dead. But with a secret gun taped to his back, John shot Hans in a surprise attack. Hans fell out the window, still holding Holly's arm, and slowly, deliberately raised his firearm. The tenacious villain held on by his nails till John unhooked Holly's watch and said, Happy trails! Bearer bonds fluttered like fresh fallen snow as Holly embraced her blood spattered bow. So, Merry Christmas to all. Be kind to one another. And most of all, Yippee Kaye, motherfucker! Thank you for listening to the Guys Who Do Stuff podcast. Visit guyswhodostuff.com. You probably shouldn't Google that. Welcome to the Guys Who Do Stuff. I'm Joe. I am Josh. This is the show where we help you get unstuck, tell a better story, and have a good answer to the question, what are you doing today? And today in the studio, we're very excited. Our first repeat guest ever. Yep. Welcome back, Neil Bailey. Woo! Thank you so much for driving out and being on the podcast with us. Neil. Joe, Josh, super excited to be here. I want to kick off and say, so you guys, I guess I'm here for the interview, but I'm going to interview you because guys who do stuff is a year old. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are in a beautiful studio. Um, yeah. This is uh, very, very high end, I must say. I'm feeling a little intimidated by the quality in here. <laughs> yeah, well, you look great in here. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So, Joe, tell me, come on, man, what's it like? You've been doing this for a year, building your audience, getting some really cool people on yeah. and listening. And uh, I, how do you feel? I think overall, I feel very excited about where the show's at. I feel very humbled about how many people have been listening and the feedback we've been getting. Because, you know, it just started out, Josh and I, as a conversation in early January. I had just left a job I had been at for forever. And Josh and I, we, we were buddies, but we weren't, like, close friends at the time. And we uh, he called, and we were just chatting one night. I think it was, like, 10 o'clock at night. And we were like, man, we just need to be telling better stories with our yeah. lives. Yeah. Like, just having that type of conversation, just catching up two friends and yeah. i don't know who pitched it first but it was like kind of at the same time it was like we should do a podcast yeah and josh mentioned the idea of in the past he'd had an idea of like just talking to people that he knew and people that he liked yeah. and i thought man that sounds like a lot of fun and i had done a podcast studio before at my previous job and just i really liked the medium and i thought i wanted to do it more so i think it was like eight hours later we like borrowed a bunch of gear from yeah. people that we knew <laughs> yeah. in town and we're like we're doing it we're doing yeah. a podcast and uh yeah doing our first guest and we just lined some people up and started going and a couple of things like we we one we committed to do a year because i know like the way stuff works anytime you're building something you can't just assume it's going to be great right off the bat i listened back to some of those early episodes and i'm like oh we've learned some stuff since then yeah that i <laughs> that i wish we would have known now and so we've we've learned a lot as well as just like selfishly like for me i've learned a ton about podcasting and also open up this podcast studio called Podcast Carry. And I'm producing different shows for different local businesses right now. And I am really enjoying this, this platform. But one of the things we've talked about is like, nobody has hour long conversations with humans anymore. Yeah. And just how enriching it's been in our lives personally to have a dedicated couple of hours a week where we just ask and listen to somebody and learn from their experience and what they've gone through. And it's been like free business coaching for us because we've talked to a lot of people and I know I've applied a lot of the stuff I've learned to my company and to my life. Yeah, it's been great to persevere now. We're at a year and uh, with season two coming up and what are we going to do and the, the crossroads there. And it's just been a real blessing and opportunity to get together and, and like Joe said, learn from learn from others and have that affect our lives in a positive way. My big desire, and I, I told somebody the other day and I said, maybe in 10 years, and he's like, it's not going to be 10 years, but like the type of job that that I did at Hope and that you've been doing for a long time used to only be done in Hollywood. It was like in LA and it was in New York. People make films, people 
do the stuff that sets pop culture. And now, since the tools have gotten so much better and so many people have gotten more interested in the field, my hope would be everything just gets hyper local. Like I want to be watching the Netflix shows that are made in my city that have the background of, of where I live made by people that I might run into into target yeah. when I'm binge watching, you know, like I want that future. There's and that's what I think yeah. is cool about podcasts because yeah. you can, you can get hyper local, you can get hyper niche. And to be like on the cusp of, you know, the generation that came before Instagram, it's, uh, it's nice to have something to do that I feel like, you know, I'm carrying on the, carrying the torch or, or helping pass that torch on of substantial conversation. So you can't fake it in an hour long conversation the way you can in a social media post, you know, it's yeah. not so curated. It's and, like, I, and I hear that it's going <laughs> to become more difficult for the younger folks. It is harder for those folks to have a conversation. I think we see it right with, I the, see it in my teenagers. In I your, do. You, yeah. 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 The new stats came out. It's, it's, the average teenager, average now, mm -hmm. spends seven hours on their screen a day. That does not count schoolwork. Mm. So that's in addition to any time they're spent on their screen. I school. think it's just going to head towards this Oculus stuff, just more into the virtual world and yeah. living in anti -reality, the, ch the alternate realities, right? Yeah. It's like a drug. It probably won't ruin communication, but it'll mm. change it. And then we don't know what it's going to look like. Yeah, it's not going to be all negative. It's going to yeah. be, you know, I mean, everything happens for a reason. But right? Neil, you came on like guest like three. And yeah. so what have you been up to? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, we can get to that. Yeah, just, I'm super excited, you know, because when you guys came out and obviously you were at the beginning of the journey and it was a great time we had in the podcast. I had such good feedback. Yeah. I was able to tell my story. Yeah. I felt like you were really intuitive to it. I obviously I know Josh and, but I don't know you. And I thought, well, this is really great. You guys have got this great balance between, you're more tech and engineering and research. And I mean, I know you're heading to read a hundred books this year. So you're obviously yeah. jamming your brain with goodness. <laughs> and Josh is out lifting heavy weights and moving things. Yeah. Digging holes. <laughs> just, digging what? <laughs> <laughs> digging. I say. Digging holes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, okay, uh, you got the yin and the yang here. And I'm just giving them some shit. Sure. Sure. Um, no, but I did think about that this morning. I thought, you know, it, it would be nice if, if you guys would actually get on and, talk more about what you do i mean you're always interviewing your guests i know because yeah. a lot of times you know podcast is a thing that you hear a lot now oh hey, i listened to a great podcast when i was on my way so and so in the in the car the other day have you heard this new podcast and mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's a thing of our times like you said because it is communication yeah i mean sitting around bullshitting with your mates has been going on for about you know, however many however many million years we could form sentences right right so it's nothing unusual it's just we're adapting a modern technology to have that and I do agree with you with the young people of this world. I think if they're not reading and they're not having conversations, how are they going to solve the problems of the future? You know, I mean, you think about my travels. I mean, I can be in a town in Peru. It's 9.30 at night. It's pitch black. And the trailer wheel has a flat tire and the bearings are seized on. And we've got a group of people that are hungry. We'd go somewhere. Well, we've suddenly all got to pull together to fix that problem. Yeah. Somebody's got to block the traffic. Someone's got to jack up the trailer. Someone who's got more of an engineering mind, you know, that for instance came up. Someone said, well, hey, stick the thing in gear and rock the trailer back and forth and break the bearings loose because the bolts won't come off. This is all things that somebody had learned somewhere down the road. And if right. our kids are learning LOL in smiley face, what are they going to do when they face problems down the road? Yeah. If they had, don't have the depth of knowledge, I think that reading and conversation and learning brings to us. So, I think there is a bit, there is a complicated future ahead. Yeah. So I think this is definitely a great environment. Yeah. So we're doing something much bigger than ourselves sitting in here, you know, promoting stuff. We're, it does we're, seem like as a, as an advancement, like, I don't know if it's an advancement, but certainly like you mentioned, it's podcast has become in the vernacular, although it's older, it's only been the last couple of years where the phrase is like, Hey, have you heard this podcast mm. have been something that people will trade back and forth like something they're watching on TV. And so I think that by way of a medium, it has an element of imagination like reading that you have to be engaged with it a little bit differently than consuming in the traditional sense, like uh, television or media. Like you absolutely consume a podcast, but it's at least ours and a lot of them that I listen to. When I get done listening to one, I feel like more like I've watched a great documentary than I watched an episode of the office again yeah. you know what i mean like yeah. i feel like i and engage with something great opportunity to go into a lot of different lives mm -hmm. yeah. and we should all take inspiration yeah. i mean that's the thing 
I think Josh would be a great podcast because of his interesting life. Right. And I feel like as I watch Josh and I've worked with him for so many years, like I'm watching him just develop out into who he's going to be. And he's got all this incredible depth of experience behind him. Yeah. That make him an individual. And as he gets older, the, these things are going to get used more and more and more. And that's why I think he has this, you know, this this sort of set of abilities that he brings to the podcast. And then obviously you have yours. You've got a different mind than Josh when it comes to you know, technical stuff and business stuff. I think it's really great, you know, yeah. but but I think the listeners would enjoy to hear you guys' stories. Well, thanks for saying that. Thanks, Neil. Ask that's, us. That's We're an thought. open book. Let's do it. Yeah. What do you yeah. want to know? Who dressed you this morning? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, thank goodness this is not live with a TV camera. That's all I can say. You guys are wearing these sporty matching T-shirts for Laverta. Yeah. And I'm orange, wearing like bright orange. your standard like business guy that didn't try too hard outfit with some blue jeans <laughs> and a button-up shirt. <laughs> I like that. A business guy that didn't try too hard. Yeah. I was thinking more like your wife dressed you. Really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In a sense, she does help me pick up my clothes, but not daily. Yeah, you know? clearly. <laughs> well, I'm wearing snakeskin cowboy boots. When I was a kid in kindergarten, I had snakeskin cowboy boots. I got in a fair amount of trouble. I stayed out of trouble enough to survive and move on. But I had these snakeskin cowboy boots. I remember them. I don't know what ever happened to them. But then this phase of my life when I ended up in New York City for seven years, I had a, a another pair of snakeskin cowboy boots that I found in a little shoe store on Broadway. And I uh, really just fell in love with those snakeskin. They were the more European style with a zipper up the side. But I wore those sons of bitches out. And, uh, man, those were great boots now in this phase of life where I'm more responsible and I have a house and I have a marriage and I have, a, you know, all these responsibilities and it's more balanced than ever. I came across these great new cowboy boots. They're limited edition from a company called Tecovas out in uh, Austin, Texas. And I was in Austin, Texas uh, for work and I saw, I went in the store and saw them, but they have a great Facebook and social media campaign and a great story. And uh, I was like, I got to get these boots, man. These are killer. So I asked my wife, I said, what do you, how do you feel about me spending $350 on a pair of boots? Is that cool? And now I wear these snakeskin cowboy boots and I feel, I feel good in them. So you feel like the last time you thought you were cool is when you're wearing snake cowboy boots and yeah. now you're like, I'm back. Yeah. And I'm not out kicking ass. <laughs> I mean, I'm kicking ass in a way, but I'm not out like doing all the stupid stuff I did when I had the cowboy boots in New York, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's a more responsible era and it's, it's good. It's good, man. Neil spent the night at my house last night and that was great. So he was like our first house guest. It was fantastic, yeah. yeah. We got to hang out in the garden by the fire pit. And yeah, I had a fire watching, pit going. Watching Dude. the sun jump off the swing and the dog running around. And Yeah. Did you try one of the Carolina Reapers you've been growing? He gave me one to bring home. I have a friend I'm going to give it to. I think it's, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm from England. I mean, I grew up with food with no flavor, so the idea of a hot chili pepper is not yeah. going to work for me. We'll pass that forward because it's a good pepper. It's a Carolina <laughs> Reaper, man. Have you tried one yet? Have I tried one? Yeah. Bro, I eat them every day. Really? My wife's like, you better slow down on that stuff. I don't eat them like raw every day, but I've made them into, I made them into flakes and into olive oil. So, so far that's the extent of my recipes, but I have them and I'm preserving them in different ways. Oh, that's fun, man. Yeah. I even put a little in my beer. It's good. But I think that was, you know, kind of pertinent to the conversation was like, I could have just driven up here this morning, skidded in, done the podcast and left. I hadn't seen Josh for a while. Hadn't seen the new house. Yeah. I feel like we were connected by the time we get here this morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just that communion, right? I mean, yeah. that's what our life is about. And it gives me an opportunity to look at Josh's life and go, yeah, oh, yeah congratulations, dude. Great house. Things are going well. The kid's happy. The dog's great. And so, oh, you know, and I saw Josh a couple of times kind of pull back up and go, yeah, that's right. You know, life is good. My life is really together. I think we, we're so involved in the process of our own life sometimes. Yeah. We need another lens to look in on it yeah, and I think say, hey, you know, you've really got your shit together here, dude. This is great. Yeah. Maybe like with you guys. Hey, you're at a year on your podcast. A year ago, you were at my house, and this was all just a goal for you to get to here. Yeah, so right. when we started the podcast, third episode in or whatever, we drove to Charlotte in the rain. So it was pouring down mm. rain, and we took this portable studio that we had at the time and set it up and did Neil's there. But, but yeah, so this is a sort of a circular experience today. I very rarely take in moments and stop and celebrate when you get something done because goals can kind of slide, right? As soon as you kind of meet them, you can change them. As soon as you find a better goal, like you mentioned earlier, like reading 100 books this year, and I realized, so I got about 60, 70 books in, and I had this realization that by reading so much content, 
I was going a mile wide and an inch deep. Mm. And I decided I needed to pick some good books and read them over and over again and try and go for depth. So I actually gave up on that goal or modified it in a sense to what I thought would be a better purpose, which is how do I actually in, internalize some very valuable information into my life as opposed to just kind of just slamming information in because I'm reaching a goal. And I think the idea of the podcast, I'm always dealing with imposter syndrome, right? Like who am I to be here in this room with these people? And those types of feelings are always coming in and muddying up what should be there, which is gratitude and I'm here to learn. And, yeah, and this is a privilege. I mean, yeah, it's when a privilege. You, when you, obviously I've been a working journalist you know, over 20 years, I mean, you have this privilege to go into these amazing lives and you get an invitation to a dinner table that the majority of people will never get. It's mm. inside someone's personal feelings, inside their head, inside their life. Yeah. Mm. And it is a privilege, I think. And I think if you bring gratitude to it like that, you're, yeah. that's the right path for all of this. And I believe that that has been a big part of the story of this show is the gratitude that we've continually felt by how generous people are with what they've learned how helpful they've been when we ask for help along the way. Like sometimes when the interview is over, we'll just be like, hey, this is what we're going through with somebody that's been there. Uh, do you have any suggestions? And they'll give us incredible feedback that we probably would have had to pay a consultant, you know, thousands of dollars for them even to whisper to us in a corner, you know, <laughs> you know, kind of stuff. But people have been so, I think, transparent with their life and what they've learned where I thought, probably going in that when we talk to people who were professional or who had built a career, they might be a little bit more reserved or guarded or fearful of sharing, but they haven't been. Yeah, we've been fortunate in that our guests are generous. I guess it's kind of a prerequisite for being on the show, right? Like you got to want to share. I think when you're on for a longer period of time, I mean, you know, one thing I always would be, be aware of, you know, making television with people is, you know, I just want to say to these people, you know, Get off the PR script and just be yourself. <laughs> yeah, right? that's the thing. Because we've all got a PR script. And, yeah. and by the time an hour's run up, you're off script. Yeah. But in a lot of times in television interviews, they might look really natural, but they're delivering a pre-recorded right. response. Sure. Yeah, I struggle with that in my, being in my own head here. But that's a good thing to remember and to grow and evolve to is just to be, you know. It's where we changed kind of our question set too when we realized like there's going to be a transition in the show. In the first part, they're guarded and they're just... They're, yeah. they're guarded because they don't know us that well, a lot of the people coming on. And so we we try to keep it light in the top of the show and talk about their business, what they've learned in business, et cetera, et cetera. Have yeah. you tried the pull my finger trick? Uh-uh. <laughs> 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 no, it's a very small studio. I feel like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would just linger. Yeah. It would <laughs> I think I flirted with some ideas to break the ice. People love the conversational vibe, you know, just not so much of an interview. Another thing that I've been realizing through the podcast is that people want to have a deep conversation with you. And I say that because after leaving, you can tell the people that are nervous when they're coming in. I haven't had anybody that doesn't seem genuine after it's over me. Like, that was more fun than I thought. They were almost surprised. Like, that was more fun than I thought it was going to yeah. be. One of the things we decided early on is we want to be everybody's cheerleader. And we're not trying to catch anybody off guard or be intentionally controversial in a way that is divisive with, but I mean, with our but, guests. But there's so much of that right now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, social media is such a huge tool to just spew your own agenda. Yeah. And, and in the podcast situation, you're open to interpretation and learning of what someone's saying. You're not here. You know, if I say, you know, it's a beautiful day outside, you're not here to tell me it's not a beautiful day, which is essentially what this political stuff is. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, the great part about politics is everybody's right. No one ever leaves the discussion going, oh, maybe I should change my thinking here a bit. Yeah. Right. Which is what we would really like to do in life. I was out in California just a couple of weeks ago and segue into talk, what we're going to talk about with the Laverta project. And, you know, my buddy just had to literally beat me around the head with a baseball bat to get me to change my thinking. Right. Because I was just so locked into my idea. Yeah. And even though I'm open to go and want him to change my thinking because he has more skills at that in that than I do, it's still really, really difficult. To roll over and go, oh, I'm wrong. Okay, you're right. Let's do that. And I think that's what's kind of cool more about the podcast is you're not here to yeah, to just promote your own idea. You're here to learn and you're here to open up things and share. Yeah, I have a problem with admitting I'm wrong too. And I have a problem with who I hear it from. So I need to hear it from like 20 people before it starts to 
make sense in my pea brain to change a tactic and be like, mm-hmm. oh, I should, I should stop doing that. In the sense of like my business and growing my business in the last year, there have been countless times where I've learned from people who have been there before, who have grown businesses, started businesses, lost businesses, and uh, the people that we have, have talked to on the podcast. It's been comforting in a weird way that nobody has the same formula. Yeah. Like we'll have one person on and he'll say, burn the ships. You got to just cut the rope. You got to go. You got to do it. And then the next person will be on. No, I'd never do that. I go slow. I do my thing. I just count the cost step by step. And then you grow it over time. And they're not wrong. Kind of like you were saying about Mm. it worked for both of them. And I think that's a conversation that has been so comforting to me because it helped me to realize that there's the right way for Joe to grow his business. There's not the right way to grow a business but there's the right way for me to grow my business. Yeah, and a simple way of saying it is like, you know, when you go to do a job, you take a toolbox. There's different tools in the box. What is success? And I love asking people that question and hearing their answer. Like, how do you know? Like, what mm. is success? We talked about that on our mm. on our first mm. uh, podcast. And I love bringing that question up because nobody has the same answer. Because business, life, relationships are infinite games. They don't have an end point. Mm. And so the point of an infinite game is to keep playing and not to run out of resources or go bankrupt. Yeah, and I had an interesting conversation with a friend of mine. I mean, he's a, you know, he's a type A industrialist, you know, very wealthy, multimillionaire, just a driver, right? right. And, and, and success to him is more conquest, more business, more moving forward. And you know, success to me is hiking Mount Kenya in, in, in Kenya or, you know, right. going to Zanzibar or, you know, being in the villages of Kenya or doing something. And and to him, it would be the last thing on earth he would ever want to do because he just wants to keep driving and, 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 and doing deals and, 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 you know, being a warrior in that space. And right. there's no one to say which one of those is more successful than the other. They're just completely different. Now, if he was trying to live my life, he would be unsuccessful. If I was trying to do his life, I'd be unsuccessful. Right. We're, we're successful in our lives because we're doing what we want to do. And I think that's where... I feel sad for a lot of societies. They just spend so much of their life being told what to do, not doing what they want to do. Yeah. And, you know, I see a little bit of that in Josh. Like, he's always been a person that did what he wanted to do, and he gets a little bit like, oh, maybe I should be a bit more, you know, a bit more like Joe and be a bit more minded or, but, you know, but I'm <laughs> Josh. And that's fine. I mean, we're always going to have that balance yeah. in life. So I think, you know, for me to encourage Josh, I just say keep being who you are. Because who who he is is cool, right? Right. And, and his experiences, and, and then he brings it to the table with his energy. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to wear cowboy boots and leather jackets to business meetings, but you gotta, I think you should. I got to think about this a little more. I got to. Yeah, I'm going to try it. We'll we'll, we'll report back on that. But yeah. yeah. Next year for, for the third anniversary. For the third anniversary, <laughs> I have struggled with that so much this year. Like that whole point of what you're talking about, from going out of a job that I was good at for ten years. To starting a business with I don't I don't care who you talk to about like these mythical people that start businesses and they're great right off the bat. Like that just hasn't been my story. It's been fun. It has been energizing. I've had more time to spend with my family, uh, which I find enjoyable. And then on the flip side of it, I I've made a lot less money. I've worked harder than I've ever worked in my life. I had a lot of like self doubt in feeling like, did I do the right thing? Is this smart? And I love asking people the question, and I, I try to ask it on almost every episode, like how long before it stops feeling like you're Sisyphus pushing the rock up until it's like, oh, it's a business, and now it's a, it's a thing. <laughs> and everybody's answer is different. I'll get like two years, 12 years, six yeah. months. And that that part of your kind of lizard brain that wants you to just hear somebody else's way of doing it and be like, oh, you're doing it wrong, idiot, is like this constant tension in my mind. Like you should be further. You should be better. You should be... And then I vent to my wife and she's like, you just started a business. You're doing okay. And then she'll read the numbers over and it's like, it's not awful. It would be great if you made more money, but this is what it's like, you know, and you got to think in terms of years. And then I was, I was recently listening to an audible book about the Swiss company that made the knives, the Swiss knife company. Swiss army. Yeah. But they have a, they have a different parent company okay. name. Vitronox. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's it. That's their name. You're welcome. See, I know knives. Boom. So they had this crisis in after 9-11 because the airline said you can't travel with these that were the luxury gifts that every office, every business professional gave. 
And so they had to reinvent their company. And now only 30% of their market is from knives. Now they're doing like travel gear and fragrances oh, and yeah. all this other stuff. And there was a quote from the, the, the guy who ran the company that basically said, we don't think in terms of quarters. We think in terms of generations. Well, I would answer your question, when will you feel comfortable with what you're doing? Is the day you wake up inside feel comfortable? I think that's it. And I know yeah. that that's the answer. I've always known contentment was the answer. Yeah. I mean, it's the day you wake up, hey, I'm doing this. Yeah. There's no, there's no doing, there's no getting to something. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it. This is it. It's not, I'm not going to wake up one morning and go, oh, ding, two years, we're there. Right. You know, because there's always a challenge in it. But I think when you actually understand, hey, I'm in this, I'm doing this, this is mm -hmm. who I am and what I'm doing. Yeah. Back to this earlier conversation we had before the podcast about when we create the narrative, because we live by the narrative that we create. That's right. And for Josh and I as motorcyclists, we break that down a little more simply to you go where you look. Yeah. yeah. So you're screaming down a dirt bike path, you know you're a little bit too fast, you go into the corner, you look at the tree, where are you going? Yeah. The tree. In the tree. It's just that simple, you know? Yeah, I think you're right. My wife would tell me, like, we'd go, we'd go to church, and she'd be like, when people ask you what you do, you almost, like, make an excuse. Mm. And she was bringing up what you're saying, <laughs> like, the narrative. It was like, how's it going? Huh? Oh, it's going. It's hard. It's hard. Right. right. Fly, 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 fly. <laughs> and you just kind of start barfing on people. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, where yeah. we put in the donation box <laughs> at that point, you know? So I reacted poorly, as most husbands do, to criticism from their wife and be like, yeah, uh and then after thinking about it, realizing, you know, she was, she's absolutely right. And uh, kind of tried to, and I remember her bringing it up a while ago, like a couple of weeks ago. So this was probably like six months ago. She brought it up again. And I'm like, but you haven't seen me do that lately, right? Because I kind of, I put a line in the sand. I'm like, I'm not going to do that nonsense anymore. Like when somebody asks how it's going, I'm going to focus on the things that I really like and how it's going. It is a perspective thing that I think not only doesn't invite people to join you in your story when you talk crappily about your story, <laughs> like you're not telling a good story. Yeah. And so people don't want to join in that story. Yeah. They don't want to buy uh, anything from you. They don't want to either buy anything, work with you, yeah. continue the conversation yeah, with you. They don't want to be <laughs> friends with somebody like that. Yeah. Well, just got to, just got to just hear it firsthand a second. So I've thought a lot about this over the years. You know, how do you, <laughs> how do you spin being an idle bum that doesn't get out of bed in the morning, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's like you just peeled back and that's like the right. worst version of what you describe right. as yourself <laughs> so so the lady that runs this place came in and she was chatting back and forth and Joss was talking a little bit about the project and she was kind of like I think she sort of like what do you do kind of thing I yeah. said well yeah I just get up every day and do something yeah. and then at the end of the day I go to bed and I get up tomorrow and do it again and she's just like you know, just this light goes on and this amusement value to that yeah. but that's really what it is Yeah, I mean what is it? I mean, we just get up every day and we do things, right? Well, I'll tell you when... And if we're guys that do stuff... Oh, was that a shameless plug for the guys that do stuff? <laughs> no shame in that game, brother. <laughs> I think, uh, so the first time we met, we were driving home, we were talking about our conversation. You left an impression on me in the sense of, you might spin it as like the guy that just wakes up and does something and then it goes back to sleep. But the way I was living my life, it felt like you had figured out what adventure looks like. Like being present in the moment doing the things that that bring you joy and being content with it. And so I bet that that's everybody across the board. Like wherever you are, the opposite version seems like they've got their crap figured out. And that's the person we're worried about judging us. Like you're worried about a guy who is in my set mindset thinking like, oh man, this guy just sits around. And the opposite was true. Like I just want to be more like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet that's the case across the board. Yeah, we are guys. Well, guys, I could say from my observations, guys and, and gals are wired differently, right? Guys are more often geared towards tasks and conquering and moving forward and doing things. Yeah. Whereas women are more geared towards intimacy and relationships, right? Nurturing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we're dealing, we're discussing, we're dealing with this sort of DNA that we have in us, this wiring. Like, how do we deal with that? in our identity also because we want to be significant, even though we're doing stuff. I think the feeling of wanting to be significant is simply a clever disguise on discontentment. Mm. Can you repeat that? I think it's just a clever disguise on discontentment. I think wanting to be significant is... Saying what I am is not good enough yeah, at the moment. I wish I was more. Mm. I wish other people noticed that I was more. 
the search for significance when it comes to career is what I think I'm trying to vilify a little bit. Uh-huh. Significance in like leaving a legacy for your family and being remembered. I think all that stuff is great. I think the idea of I wish I had more influence. I wish I was more significant in my job, in my company is, is just the motivator for a lot of shady stuff. Well, and that's Ooh. maybe where podcasts are helpful because if somebody has listened to a podcast and somebody comes on that they relate to or their journey they relate yeah. to, it allows you to think differently. Right. I mean, for some reason, I think differently about my life. And sometimes I feel a bit selfish because I've always chosen what I wanted to do and I've always done what I want to do. And my friend I was talking about earlier, you know, he he literally pulls his hair out when he keeps just saying, but how does Neil make money, <laughs> right? Because his life's about making money, right? Right. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, he's a capitalist businessman and that's what he mm-hmm. does, right? This is joy, that's his pleasure, that's his success and that's his driver. And the question really should be, how does how do you make Neil want to make money? Yeah. And and just, you know, segueing into what I'd like to talk to you today is why the pair of us are sitting here in matching shirts with my Laverta project, which is new. Yeah. I don't know that we touched on it last time. You know We teased it out a little bit, but we didn't right. get to talk about it. You know, in the world of business and um, commerce and corporations and stuff, it's a really bad idea. I want to take the old motorcycle I had when I was a kid put it together, take it to England and drive through the lanes and hang out with my buddies. This is a terribly bad business, right? (laughs) There is no path to fame or fortune. There's no path to huge income, you know, and there could be path to financial ruin, right? Because I'm so busy putting my bike together and spending all my resources and taking all the time. But I honestly do not give a shit. You couldn't, you couldn't take the idea away from me and give me a pile of money and say, here's your pile of money, do something different, but you can't do that. Because that's what I want to do. Right. And and it doesn't make me wrong. It doesn't make me right. But I think this is sometimes what I feel sad for people is, is that they, they get forced into a life that they don't have control over. You know, the bank man, you know, the mortgage guy gets them into a house that's too big for them. The car dealer gets them into a car that's really expensive. Right. The, the, suddenly they've got to spend 10 bucks to buy their bottle of washing liquid when you could buy a bottle for three. And on and on and on and on to the next thing. There they are, indentured servants to an idea, an idea that they need this car, they need these clothes, they need this washing powder. Right. You know, I mean, you can spend a dollar on a thing of toothpaste or you can spend 10 bucks. I mean, every last single facet of our life we're marketed to to feel bad if we take the cheap choice. You right. Know, it's our quality from the jeans we wear to the shirts we wear. And I think that's sad that people are so, because they don't connect their freedom or the time is a value. Hey, right. I've got to be in this job and do this thing. So therefore, therefore yeah. I have that car, therefore I have this stuff. And then you take a decision to do something different. Hey, I'm not going to get up in the morning and go to that corporate job and do what I was really good at and get that paycheck and have my life owned by that company. I'm going to do my own thing. So I would imagine there's a lot of growing pains for you to change in that year. I mean, I hear it in Josh all the time. I mean, not in a bad way. I mean, he's an analytical person, but you know, my advice to Josh would be just keep doing what you're doing because what you do is very good. But, you know, and like this morning I said to him, you know, we were just talking a little bit. I said, dude, what a great life you've got. You're here in the morning to make your son breakfast and take him to school. Yeah. And you're here in the afternoon to pick him up. That's the greatest success in your life. Yeah. The house, like we, the, the, the house, the job, the career, the bicycles, the podcast. I mean, that's all great stuff. But the real success is he is with his son every morning and he's with his son every right. afternoon. He's not in an airplane somewhere eating a meal out of a plastic bag at 30,000 feet with a bunch of other people hammering away on laptops right. late for a meeting somewhere so he can grind out some new deal. to make So that one day, hopefully, he has enough time to spend with his son. And who have will breakfast. now be gone. <laughs> and the cats <laughs> in the cradle and the silver spoon. <laughs> yeah. Little boy blue and the man on the moon. Exactly. Yeah, I'm not so sure about the singing career. I mean, I've been <laughs> kind of bumming No, him I can do it. I was in the wrong key. <laughs> I'll just fix it in post. And the cat's in the cradle <laughs> and the seals. He's going to go back for it. I'll be back from the bathroom in a moment. <laughs> when you were talking, um, it reminded me of one of the other big lessons that I learned. I think from you, I learned about the importance of treating life like it's an adventure. And then we interviewed a guy also pretty early on, uh, Charlie Ingle. 
Oh, and, yeah, um, yeah, I know Charlie well. And you got us that interview. Thank you so much for that, because mm. that was another big life lesson for me, actually, because I've told Josh, and I and I think I told you, like, if I ever write a book about the journey of doing a podcast, I know what the ending is now, And because I really, one thing he said just bugged me. It stuck in my craw for months, like four or five months. I don't like it when I can't understand stuff, mm. but he was so confident when the way he said it, like, I was like, it must be true. So he was talking about how running is just in, in any kind of exercise or any kind of challenge, if you just change your relationship to pain, you'll be fine. And so we started training and we started thinking we're going to run a marathon and stuff. And so I would train and I'd be like, all right, it's start to hurt. And I'd be like, all right, change your relationship with pain. Go. One, two, go. No, it no takes pain time. still sucks. And what I realized finally, because I'm dense after months and months of letting this idea just kind of ruminate in my head was it's the pain in our lives that cause us to grow. Mm-hmm. Without the pain, there's no growth. Without growth, there's no story. And we started this thing to tell a better story. And if you try to eliminate pain, and Charlie would put himself in the position to find pain because he wanted to see what was there. Mm-hmm. You know, he wanted to see what was under it all. It was like his way of saying, he said something along the lines of, it just kind of clears out all the bullshit. And so you just get to the point where like that's what's actually there. Disclaimer, that could be masochistic, right? <laughs> it could be. Yeah. But I think in the context of, of the way I'm talking about it now, like what I really appreciate it is the, it doesn't mean that we should be hiding from the difficult stuff. Right. In fact, it kind of gives us, but we do hide from the difficult stuff. We do. And that's what causes us pain. And that was really a turning point for me. Cause again, it goes back to the contentment. It goes back to my attitude and the way I see my life right now. Like you could choose to look at leaving a job and taking a harder route as that was stupid because that was not the path of least resistance. Mm. Or you could choose to look at it like, I'm setting out on this adventure, and I'm going to be changed through it and come out much better on the other side because I'm not. I'm choosing not to be comfortable. And you're choosing to be free, and that's what people yeah. don't do. Mm. Um, just to your Charlie Engel comment, I have a, a, a mentor, Mac, who's an older guy in my life. And you know, many years ago, we would play tennis, and he would – We'd be sweating away and pissing and moaning about the heat. And Mac would be like, well, I just don't get hot. And I was like, yeah, you're so full of shit, dude. I mean, what's all this stuff? <laughs> Mumbo jumbo, you know, I don't get hot business. Well, a few weeks ago, I was training for a um, trail race that I did out of the White Water Center. And I'd had a pretty big bicycle ride in the morning. I wanted to do some running in the afternoon. And, you know, I'm a little older now, so this is not the easiest for me. And uh, so I hit the Greenway. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. There's nobody there because it's 97 degrees and 100% humidity. Imagine that, right? And I'm just running along and I'm doing my run. And guy comes the other way, young guy with a little water bottle and he's sweating like I am. And he nods at me and I nod at him. And then I turn and I come back. And as I'm coming back the other way, the guy goes, God, I guess it could be a little bit hotter. Eh? And he kind of runs off. And in that moment, I realized I hadn't even thought about the heat. Mm. I was just running. I was doing what I needed to do. And the reason that I was doing what I needed to do is because I have adopted Max philosophy that I don't get hot. I can't explain it. I mean, it's yeah. just, and, and I go out on these bicycle rides and I go out and I listen to my buddies pissing and moaning about the heat. And I think of all the energy that they put to it, right? All the time you think about it. I, I just don't get hot anymore. And it's, and, but I do remember when Mac first put the theory to me. I just thought he was completely full of shit until I actually put it into operation. So back to what you're saying about Charlie with the pain thing, right? It is just in our minds. Yeah. And we can overcome it. I mean, we can change it. We can improve it. And and when he said it, like I said, it was like so clear that he was not making crap up. Like he was not like, it was like obvious to him. It was so like, yeah, I just, yeah, I mean, I, I walk into I, the I walk I walk into the YMCA to go work out, and the ladies behind the counter. It's ninety seven degrees. I come in on my bicycle. Like, oh, you rode here? I said, yeah. Because oh, it's so hot out there. Because oh, I don't get hot. Yeah. Oh no, I do. I mean, I have a you know, and I'm like they like like I'm from a different planet or something. You know? And I'm a, I mean, you know, and I just say that. I said, you know, a couple hundred million years of evolution. You know, the human actually knows what to do with heat. It sweats, it, it slows down, it changes its metabolism. I mean, we can actually live through this, but yeah, you know, we've only had air conditioning for 100 years, right? Yeah. This is not natural. It's comfort and contentment again, the theme of the episode. Like, mm. you could tr- say, like, I'm just changing my mindset or making a choice, and really the choice is to just realize you don't control the freaking heat, you know? Like, you can just be content when it's hot, be content when it's cold, 
and don't make a big freaking deal about it. Right. And it's really <laughs> worked. And it's really worked for me. And and it's it's very much how I'm running this project now in my mind, right? I'm not I'm just letting it be. Yeah. I know my narrative. I I'm doing this thing that we're talking about today, my new Laverta project. Yeah, let's and, talk about it. So you're putting together your old bike, you want to ride it around all the places that you remember kind of from your from your youth, from Yeah, so what's the story? Yeah, I guess I mean we, I hope we're not off on a tangent because I really enjoy this stuff. But yeah, I mean I wanted to talk about the Laverta project today because I feel like the year that you came before we were starting to tease this, which is a lot about you know, Neil Bailey rides and you know, you kind of coined this thing the rebel in reverse. And 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 I really enjoyed that idea, you know, being fit, yeah. being healthy, being clean in my habits, you know, after kind of a checkered youth. And so in all of this, this this project just started coming into my mind about wanting to go home about my old motorcycle, about the people I've been around. And I've just let it come. You know, I'm not pushing it. I'm not forcing it. I'm, it things are drawing to it. Even like being here with you today. I mean, somehow Josh and I were talking about something and first thing from my mind was I was going to drive up to Raleigh and hang out with you guys and, and talk about the project today. Now here we are talking about the project. We're talking about you know my new Laverta project. And the listeners can listen to the story today and then you can go to my YouTube channel and see the videos we're creating. Yeah. And it's about a journey. And for me, I think it's a lot of, it's a culmination of everything I've done in my life. I've told a lot of people's stories, even with Neil Bailey rides and wellspring, my foundation, I'm telling the stories of the abandoned children. I'm telling the stories of the people I take on the trips in my career. I'm riding a motorcycle. I'm telling the story of the motorcycle or the engineer who built it. And the Laverta project, maybe again, a little bit selfish. It's entirely my story where I came from, where I grew up, who my friends were, the motorcycle I rode, the experiences I've had. And that's what this whole thing is about. Yeah. And it's this, you know, I've had to kind of develop a type of confidence, a little bit like I don't get hot anymore. I'm just doing this project. You know, where's the money come from? Where's the sponsorship come from? Where's the funding come from? How's this going to work? I don't care about any of that. I'm just doing this project. And it came out of one day, came out of a lot of things. I rode around England in 2013 and I probably wrote the first story that I ever used the sort of artistic pentimento um, technique where in the story I started really adding in things that had happened in my earlier life and combining it with the modern travels. Mm -hmm. And quite by chance, I'm on YouTube one day and this video pops up and it's a young fellow from my hometown flying a drone over my hometown. And he talks about it with this beautiful music. And I'm looking at the beaches that I ran on as a kid. I'm looking at the harbor walls that I fished from. I'm looking at the pier that I used to lose my pennies on in the slot machines. And he just said that Greek mythology said, every life is a thread in a tapestry. And we're connected, intrinsically connected to everybody we meet. And everybody we meet and connect with forms that life's tapestry for us. And no matter how far you go, how much you learn or how much you grow, you're always intrinsically connected to everybody you've ever met. And you're connected to your home. And I watched this fucking video and started crying. Right? <laughs> and I just was like, I want to go home. Yeah. And in that moment, I realized that, you know, I... I put a bag on my back and hitchhiked to London. We talked about it, you know, landed in America with a hundred dollars in my pocket, you know, and I've never permanently lived in England again. And I just, in that moment, it's like, I want to go home. I just want to go home. I, my DNA is there. My family's there. This is my home. I mean, I've been here raising kids the last yeah. 20 years. And from that notion, the idea of my old motorcycle, ah, take the old motorcycle home. So this Laverta project really is stage one in a three-phase idea that I have. The first one's called the Laverta project, and that's what we're here to talk about today. But it's really just a mechanism to get to going home, and that's going to be the name of the documentary. So when the bike is built, mm. and you're kind of ahead of the curve with me letting out this information, when the bike is built and we take it to England for the summer, we're going to create a documentary called Going Home. And then my real ambition of that would be once going home is up and running, it would lead to the movie One Way Ticket. This big thing in my life. I mean, the stories I have of my friends are just so crazy. And, and every year we get beyond them, they get more crazy. 
and it's yeah. historical and it's the 70s, the 80s, punk rock, Margaret Thatcher, yeah. the Falklands, Charles and Die. And you shared some of that in the first podcast. So if you haven't listened, if you haven't listened yet, you should definitely go back and check it out. I think the premise of the story that you're telling is so fantastic because it's the context is so much bigger than Neil wants to go home and be reminded of stuff because he saw a YouTube video. The context is we all are looking for home. Some of us don't even know what it is. Mm, mm. And I would hope that I would hope that for you guys in your journey of this podcast and the work you're doing in your families, that just trust in the idea that I have that I'm on the path of what I want to do will work in what you're doing because you're not in a conventional situation anymore. You've, yeah. you've burned the boats. Mm-hmm. I mean, you haven't burned the boats. I mean, you could probably go back into a job situation, but I mean, essentially, I mean, you've, you've jumped, right? right. And, and you're in that jumping space now and it's quite new, uh, but here you are. So I hope this Liberta project will be an inspiration to you too, that I'm just being led by what I need to do and the right people are coming to the project. Yeah. Well, you have a couple things out already since we were uh, together last time, right? So you have, there's a, what, one or two YouTube videos on YouTube now showing the progress of the project? Yeah. Yeah. So the first, the first one was kind of a, you know, a backstory about the bike and the the crazy story, some of the stuff we touched on, and an introduction to my buddy Dave Collier, who's kind of like the creative director of the the program. And that's an interesting story because I just I decided I'd get some stickers for my business, and I called him up, and I hadn't spoken to him in years. And suddenly, two hours later, we're in the saddle on this project together. <laughs> and and how it works? Yeah, but I think it is how it works if we allow ourselves to let it work. Right. I think when we when we just surrender and say, okay, this is where I'm going. I'm going the right direction. I'm yeah. creating the right narrative. If you don't carve out time for like those conversations, like it was a two hour conversation that started this podcast. If we would have been busy or watching Netflix, you yeah. know, we would have missed out on this whole. I think you're absolutely right. But I think, I think the system wants you, you know, I mean, guy came up to the other day and he goes, oh yeah, I'm just working on this new app. I said, well, what does it do? Well, it saves you time. He goes, well, what are you going to do with the time? <laughs> You know, time is. I'm so- gonna sell it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna sell it. I've taken. A, I've, I've. I'm into gardening a little bit now, and I have a Carolina Reaper plant that's been producing these amazing peppers. And I'm on this. So, but th- I'm on the second harvest now, and and I'm just. I'm. I'm doing rosemary and basil and thyme. Uh, not time, sorry. What am I doing, Joe? What do you is think it? cilantro? Do you think teenage Josh <sighs> would sit there and just want to slap you in the face for talking about being into gardening? Uh, he, just wanted, he just wanted to jump on a motorcycle and go to New York. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I would have not. I would have not. Yeah, I, I was a bit yeah. stressed. He was going to start singing the Simon and Garfunkel song. Uh, Rosemary, sage, 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 rosemary, and thyme. You can't get him started like that. Yeah, Neil. So yes, yeah, so, but what I'm learning is like is like confirming that you know what you spend time with, you develop a relationship with, and when you spend time with someone like your creative director you're working with or Joe and I spending time doing mm. this, you develop in that area and that harvest comes, mm. right? Mm. And it ain't easy because there's a drought and there's, there's this and there's that. But in, in, in what it is, is time yeah. right? where we put our time. Well, I don't think it's gardening. I think for you, gardening is something that you're doing at home with your family. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. And that's, that's yeah. the appeal and it's that's why gar- you like it so much. Yeah. I love spending time at home with my family. It's true. Yeah. That's a, yeah. And you can't do that not in your yard, not with your kid, yeah. you know, not with your dog uh, running around. And teenage Josh grew up on a farm, so now I'm really seeing that full circle appreciation of, like, being yeah. in my outdoors clothes and just mowing the yard and being, like, in the, you know, out there cultivating something with my son running around. And that's very similar to my going home. Like, I want to be home in England with my motorcycle. I want to go yeah. recreate what I grew up in. Yeah. And I do love you think that. that's a full cycle thing about really just discontentment? Because we all th- want. I don't think it's discontentment. I mean, I think well, it's it might have started young... out as like Maybe. we leave home because we didn't think home was yeah. good enough. Good point. You're right. Yeah. Because yes. I did leave home because it was it wasn't enough for me, and it's yeah. taken me three decades to realize how incredibly beautiful and special my home is. Yeah. yeah. And and mm-hmm. these wonderful storylines are coming out. And obviously, I'm a storyteller. I mean, I guess we sort of preface yeah. this for the podcast for anybody listening I mean, <laughs> you know i neil bailey i'm a storyteller that's what i do i mean i don't i'm not an engineer i'm not a doctor i'm not a podcast guy i mean i am a storyteller and so in this storytelling thing um i look at it 
I'm looking at your computer with the different layers of audio and I think about making TV where you have all these different timelines. Mm -hmm. B-roll, there's the shot, there's the audio, there's the music, there's the effects, the transitions. You know how you build. You build with all these layers. Well, it's the same with the Laverta project. We're building with all these layers. And so I I go to visit with a young lad called Dean and he has a a magazine called uh, Dice Magazine. And he was mentored by a kind of a teddy boy out of London who started the magazine and he passed away and now he's, he has the magazine. And we're sitting in his Ford Galaxy 1966 and here he is with this sort of London accent, his teddy boy hair cutting his tattoos and I'm sort of looking across this acres of chrome dashboard and Dino's just face from fucking London, mate. Like, you know, he's all giving it all that, you know, this is what you got to do, you know, like, I mean, what you got to do, mate, you got like, you really got to get on this, you know, and... So he sounded a bit like Russell Brand at the time. And then, anyway, so he comes up with this idea that we should make these Laverda t-shirts. And I said, well, we're not in the t-shirt business, dude. We're putting a motorcycle back together for a documentary. I said, we'd be selling t-shirts for 20 years to make enough money to make a documentary. He goes, no, you're missing the point. He goes, I said, well, what's the point? He said, well, you make the t-shirts. I said, well, what are we doing? He said, well, you give them to people. I said, well, what do we do that for? He says, well, it'll start some conversations. And it'll bring some influence. And no one's allowed, you can only get one if you're part of the project. So Josh is wearing a Laverta t-shirt. He's part of the project, right? Well, sure enough. So I post a couple of pictures on um, social media of me with a friend of mine, Rebecca, wearing our Laverta t-shirts. Phone rings. Joe Totora out of New York. He has Moto Italia, big European dealer, very prestigious guy. He's worked on all Laverta's, worked on Ducati's. And he's really well up there. And he says, hey, I want to buy a t-shirt. Can't buy him. Well, why not? they're not available (laughs) so i let him leak me into the project right well i had met joe in italy actually in a whorehouse in uh, Mizano, but that's another story we're on a promoted junket they took us on a cultural experience to lady godivers so (laughs) lady godiver yes that's another crazy story so anyway joe um, says he wants two t-shirts and the short story is he wants a t-shirt for a guy called lewis ray and Joe works on Lewis Ray's old 70s Lavertas. And apparently, Evil Knievel used to jump a Laverta. He has records jumping, they, but they called him American Eagle in America. They didn't call him Laverta because mm. I guess they fi- figured it wouldn't sell. And Lewis Ray, his piece de resistance is he dresses up like Evil Knievel and he jumps over shit on his Laverta. <laughs> and he actually holds some world record for riding through fire. Huh. So I said to Joe, I said, do you think you'd like to come to England when we take the bike back and ride through a bit of fire for us? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, absolutely. So I sent him a couple of T-shirts. There you go. So you can just see that this insanity is beginning to happen. Yeah. And this, so these are all storylines. Will that come off? I don't know. I mean, will Lewis Ray come to England, dress up like Evil Knievel? I mean, to me, the idea of watching some guy dressed up like Evil Knievel wheeling up and down the seafront and in Paynton where I'm from or even driving through fire is just brilliant. Yeah. Right? But this is what's happening. And I'm just surrendering to the storylines. And there's another I mean, I think it's quite a fascinating storyline. So many, many years ago when I was a, a wee boy, my father left home. So I always tell the story he had a bit of a geography problem, right? He used to end up in the wrong bedroom a lot. And anyway, that ended them I I've been less couth about that statement for the podcast. I'll keep it clean. (laughs) So 50 years ago, dad takes off. Never saw him again, right? A few years later, some lady comes looking for him. Guess he married another lady, did the same thing. Gone, right? A few years later, the police come looking for his dental records. They find a body. So we kind of, I think, emotionally buried him at that point, right? So about six months ago, I get an email from a genealogy company in England. They're kind of like you know, estate ambulance chasers. Mm -hmm. Dad wasn't dead, right? He didn't die until 2017. Holy crap. So how long did you think he was dead? Just just 35, 40 years. Wow. So he pops up dead again. I mean, this is the stuff that you can't make up. And I think, so my sister has got this real bent to go find out more about our dad and what he did. I mean, for me, I was just a kid and he's gone. And I mean, he's been dead for so many years. It was just really bizarre that he showed up dead again, right? I mean, most people just die once. I mean, yeah. so anyway, so I just think these are some of the really cool storylines yeah. because I said to my sister, 
do not go looking for his history until I come home. And we'll go together. Yeah. So one of the storylines about me taking my liver at home will be going to find out, if we can, information about our father, who we haven't seen for 50 years. Yeah. So do you have any kind of reservations? Because, like you mentioned earlier, you're a storyteller. You've always been telling the story of the motorcycle, the story of... And we kind of talked about this a little bit when we were at your house, but it wasn't it wasn't on the podcast. But I wonder if you feel like, is it more scary to tell your story? Is it more vulnerable to be telling, like, Neil's story than to telling the story of a motorcycle or telling the story of... That's a great question. I think at the root of it, yes, it is. I think it's always a deflection when you bounce off to tell somebody else's, and then you've actually got to gut in and tell your own. Yeah. And, you know, maybe something next year I'll come to a podcast. I think, I don't want to talk about it at the moment, but I think it's really forced me to become more authentic. Yeah. And it's really forced me to look inside myself with my habits and my thoughts and the way I treat people and what I do. And it's been a real, for me, a bit of a revelation in the last couple of years. Yeah. And and it's it's left me with a situation where I definitely feel like to do this story, I have to be more authentic. Yeah. Well, I can add that I appreciate and understand your connection as an, a vehicle of identity with a motorcycle, particularly this motorcycle, and uh, your past. It's just uh, I understand that on a very deep level. Understand it in what yeah. way? What, what way does it bring to you? My first feelings of freedom were learning to ride my uh, Honda XR80 under the wings of my father who had a Honda and other motorcycles growing up. And I remember being on the farm and just coming home from school and riding my dirt bike in the forest and having these visions of seeing myself riding through the frame. So I had these visions of being in uh, or some sort of story, you know, and that bike, the way that hit me in that level, like was the first real memory I have of connecting with something larger than myself because I saw myself from uh, essentially the sky and the tree line. I can see it even today, this me riding through and the feeling of the leaves going up around me as I twisted the throttle and the feeling of adventure and threshold and the engine under me, the power, and I was controlling it and it was my, I was one with it. So that is, I don't know if I'll ever completely understand it, but it's, it's something even spiritual, you know, And then throughout my life, motorcycles have, you know, we're sitting here because of motorcycles and how they have opened doors to meet people and relate with people. They're fascinating creation. You know, it's said two wheels move this, four wheels move the body, two wheels move the soul. I mean, there's a reason that saying exists. And I think the Laverda project and Laverda itself and and going home the documentary, the, the, the building of the bike, the taking it home and the riding of the bike is just the structure that allows us to tell the story. Right. Mm-hmm. So structure, yeah. It's really it's A there's a box of parts, B um, you know, we we discuss the project, C the engine comes apart, D it goes back together. But it's what happens in between A and B that's really important. Right. Who's building the engine, who comes to the story. When we take the bike home, it's it's the stories and and I think you know everybody we're all relatable to the story. You said it earlier, we've all got this idea of going home. We're all intrinsically connected to our home. I mean, for Josh, right. maybe he's just not at an age at the moment because he's driving forward with you know marriage and kids and business. But somewhere deep in his conscious, that idea of being on the farm, he's already coming back. He's growing vegetables. He's creating yeah. the same environment for his son that he had growing up. And we're all very, very connected to that. Yeah. And I'm finding this on the journey of people that are really interested in it. There are people that are not interested to go back and dig into this part of our history. And I think maybe for them it's because that period was so painful. Yeah. Or it's not something they look back on fondly. Maybe they were in a bad childhood or a bad environment. Mm-hmm. I mean, are you is, is, are you considering writing a book also? Or is this just more of, more of a screenplay right away? I, again, the three-step process I'd like to do is one is, one is the YouTube series of putting the bike together, two is the documentary called Going Home, and three would be a movie one-way ticket about all of the madness yeah. that happened. You know, 
there are just offshoots to this. I reconnected with a friend from Alaska. We started doing some writing together. He said, you need an illustrationist because this stuff's crazy. I'm cycling on the Greenway doing my health and fitness. I run into a dude who's there with a bag of chalk drawing frogs on the sidewalk. And just two days ago, he has created the first cartoon sketch of one of my stories. And I shared it with Josh this morning and Josh enjoyed it. And I've just been gobsmacked that somebody could take my rambling story about it actually was about a thing we called the mobile moon where we used to pull our pants down when we were going down the high street and moon people from our motorcycles which is don't do this at home kids right because <laughs> i mean it's nothing like ending up in hospital with a skinned up ass and your trousers in one piece if it goes <laughs> wrong and you know my friend tried this wibbly my, my dear friend and it all went horribly wrong and it was highly embarrassing and denny just got this in a cartoon so it's opened up the concept well is this a graphic novel huh and I don't know where it's going. And I said to Denny, I'm just, I'm just so excited that you brought this energy to it. And yeah. who knows where it's going to go? I mean, it's just fascinating. That is it a novel? Is it a movie? Is it a documentary? I, it's just growing energy, and I think it'll go where it needs to go. So when, when Josh was telling the story about riding through the woods and you were seeing it, and that's kind of what you do now. Like you've actually produced commercials for motorcycle companies and – but I was I was making the connection, and I could be way off here, but it just felt like, and I don't want to be presumptuous here, but it seemed like you were the subject of that story, mm-hmm. and you're That's excited right. about being the subject of a story, and both of them had to do with home, and I wonder if that's the thing we lose when we get older and we get discontent. That feeling of home is when you're a part of the story. You're not just telling somebody else's. You're mm-hmm. not just... You're not a part of a story. Like you mentioned, like talking about me being part of a company story and having my identity wrapped around the corporate identity. And um, you're writing your story at the moment. Right. I mean, you're not ready. I mean, yes, you can talk about how you came to the podcast. I mean, I'm a lot older than you and you're not yeah. ready at that point to do it. And there are some advantages for me that I think a lot of modern American people won't have. And one is my hometown has changed very little in 50 yeah. years. You know, they're not allowed to change the buildings. It was all built up. You know, the streets, they can't widen them because there's nowhere to widen them. The the bay and the sea view doesn't change. The headlands don't change. The parks don't change. They don't build over everything. Right. And it must be very difficult for a lot of American people where if you had this idea of your home, like if Josh had this idea of the farm and riding the dirt bike and the barns and his dad and he wants to take Eli, his son, back and he gets right. there and there's a fucking strip mall right his memory's been shot under with concrete or or blown over with concrete yeah so i don't know how that would work for somebody Mm. you know the the whole state could change their whole town could have changed everything that they remember from childhood could be just gone in a heartbeat here and it's not so so i wonder how that changes my experience that everything is so similar and i feel that when i'm in devon because i have generations of people that came from my home area that when I travel through the lanes and there's 16th century coaching roads, I mean, these things have been there for over 400 years mm. and they, people's houses, they open their front door and step onto the road and they're narrow enough to take a coach. You can't pass cars in these lanes. They can't change them. They've been like that for 400 years and somewhere in those roads and somewhere in those views, that stuff is all in my DNA. My forefathers saw it, my Great grandfather saw it. My great great grandfather saw it. I I was traveling there as a kid before I could even see it. I was absorbing yeah. it. I was it was in my conscience. So for me, there's this real connection to that place. Right. All those memories, all that DNA, all those feelings, and I don't know how that must be if you go home to your original place to find a a, a strip mall. Yeah, yeah, or a strip club. <laughs> Any kind of strip, really. Yeah. New York Strip. <laughs> but the story's yeah. still there. The story's still there. The, the memories. memory's still there. Yeah. The, uh, the feeling that you had. like The the tagline in the show, the podcast, the guys who do stuff, get unstuck, tell a better story. Tell a better story comes from a book that I read by a guy who was going through the process of turning his life story into a screenplay. Mm. Um, and he had worked with a guy called Steve Taylor, and the book was about, it's called A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. And it was about like turning his idea that was a popular book called Blue Like Jazz into a screenplay. Donald Miller. Donald Miller. Mm-hmm. I read and the so book. You read that book? Mm. So there's a story in that book 
that has stuck with me in the sense of like he was going through this process of trying to turn his life story into a movie. And through that process, uh, a friend of his, totally unrelated, was sharing a difficult story that he had a teenage daughter who was getting involved into drugs and dating a loser of a boyfriend. And the dad was just expressing that he wished that she would make better decisions. Like a lot of us as parents probably have thought that thought, like I wish that she would make better decisions. And in that mindset, Donald Miller, who was not a parent at the time and noted how stupid it was that he was giving this guy advice. But in the context of what he was going through, just, it was very clear to him like, Oh, she's not telling a very good story with her life. Like her story of her life is I'm a, I'm a teenage girl that lives in my parents' house and we drive a Volvo and I might get to go to college one day and go somewhere. And, but, but, do, but, do, but do we have a system where we could show up some and go, oh, I'm signing up for the course on how to write a better story about my life. Yeah. Well, I don't you, think we do. No. I mean, you go to school to learn about math, you go to school about, you know, and mm -hmm. you know, we're so educated and so brainwashed. And there was a poor fellow at the gym the other day that kind of got a little bit of my acid tongue, you know, which I can thank my mother for in being English because we love that shit. But, you know, he was just bitching about being at the gym on a Monday afternoon because he'd eaten too much and drank too much over the weekend and he couldn't get on the weight machines. I'm just like, you know, I said, there's rats in traps with more, <laughs> with more freedom of choice than you people. What's the matter with you? Yeah. Right? And he just doesn't understand. He goes to work Monday through Friday. Right. So he's educated to go to work Monday through Friday. Right? What's he educated to do on a Friday? Go wait for an hour and a half to get in the restaurant to stuff a bunch of alcohol and junk food down his face so he can gorge out over the weekend so he can go back to the gym and fight for a little bit of space on the machine with everybody else on a Monday. Right. It's just like, could you just not put the fucking pause button on for a moment and say, honey, why don't we do this a little differently? Why don't yeah. we go to the gym on a Friday night? Okay, nobody's yeah. there. Get to work on the machines. Why don't we do something healthy over the weekend so we don't have to batter our way to the gym on Monday to try and blow off all the pans we put on over the weekend because we had to get away from the horrible job we had all week. Yeah, Maybe we could be thankful that we had a job because mm -hmm. it pays for our nice house and it pays for the dinners. And then maybe we could go to our favorite restaurant on a Monday night when there's nobody there and we won't have right. to wait an hour and a half to get in and we'll have a quiet conversation. Well, we don't. Why is it so difficult to change our thinking? And we don't have that mechanism and you're right. And they, they come in like weird moments. And that's what happened in the story in the book. So the guy, instead of being offended that Donald Miller was like, you don't know crap about me and my story. Like, <laughs> <laughs> shut up. He decided, you know what? We're right. He's right. We're living a pretty crappy story as a family. And my daughter doesn't have an exciting story. So what he decided to do was he talked to his wife and said, we're going to raise like $20,000 and build an orphanage in like Cambodia. And what happened over the next six months to a year is the daughter went from I'm bored I don't have anything to do to I'm building an orphanage in Cambodia. Change the story. And it changed her. She broke up with the loser boyfriend. She stopped doing the drugs because she was part of a better story. Yeah. I mean, guys that do stuff, people do stuff. I mean, that's, it's so, so true. Yeah. I mean, you gotta, you gotta find something to do that's challenging. And that is, but I think just like you were saying about the guy at the gym, we actually do have that control. And that's probably the so frustrating part of it. If we're living a shitty story, yeah, we can tell a better story. You're hundred percent right. I think we can. And I think that's what the Laverta project is. It's, it's, it's time for me to tell my story. Yeah. People have for, you know, so many years, come on, Neil, you gotta tell your stories. And it's not just me. I mean, my best friend, Wibbly, and um, he's horribly disabled now. And this is not the reason I am not this great guy. I'm not doing this for my buddy Wibbly. It's not like, Oh, what a wonderful person you are, Neil. I'm doing this story for me. I'm doing this primarily to satisfy what I need to satisfy in my life. So I've got to go tell my story now. But Wibbly is a huge part of that story. He's disabled now. I mean, he had a problem with his brain and no fault of his own, and he has no short-term memory, and he's like a stroke victim. Mm. But he has access to the vaults of all the stupid stuff we did when we were young. And in my mind, wrong or right, I can see me being in England for the summer, I can see me telling these stories, collating these stories, and Wibbly can just be with me every day. Can Wibbly hear this now? Yeah, he, yeah. I mean, it'd be long and, you know, this, I mean, yeah, we could certainly. You know. I mean, he could, he could hear my words right now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Wibbly, yeah, yeah. Wibbly, we love you, and yeah, you're awesome. Do. Yeah, yeah, he is awesome. And so my friend Denny did this cartoon the other day with Wibbly was the star, even if he was sliding down. Oh, yeah, mostly I saw with his that. Pants down. And, and I called his wife at 9.25 their time, and she said, I thought that was going to be you. 
and she had posted on social media, which is the brilliance of the communication systems we've got. That Denny, yeah. Denny can listen to my story, draw a cartoon, scan it, email it to me. I can post it to Facebook, and Georgia with his wife can see it. Yeah, it's a great I mean, time for storytelling, isn't it? With wow, the time. we yeah. are so incredibly fortunate. So how do how do we get involved in the Laverta Project? One, how do I get a T-shirt? And two, where can we be following and see what's going on? Well, Neil Bailey Ride's YouTube channel is the place. And and this is just another great thing, you know. So we posted video number one, and we started this conversation with guys who do stuff. You're at a year. You're trying to figure out where you are with your success in your life, and I'm seeing something, you know, obviously getting a window into Josh's life today is so cool for me to see how my buddy's doing so well. It's so cool when Josh tells me everything you're doing, how well you're doing. Maybe you're analyzing with a different metric than I'm seeing, but I'm seeing this really this really great thing. So we posted the Laverta trailer part one and it has just organically started to grow. Now, if you look at the numbers, yeah, Casey Neistat isn't going to be giving up being a YouTuber because Neil Bailey just posted this. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not, they're not phenomenal numbers. What's phenomenal about them is they're numbers that are being generated by themselves because people want to share the story and they want to promote the story and they want to do something. So, that's when you say, what can I do to help? Just your belief is what I need. Anybody you can share it with, it's great. And just your interest because that's what's going to generate the project. Yeah. It's human energy for storytelling and a good story, I feel. I'm just being confident about that. Yeah. Well, well Neil, like, it has been fantastic talking to you. Yeah, and I really appreciate this. It was great to get some stuff out of you guys today. I hope that's all right for your podcast. I know you wanted me to come talk about the project. Again, if someone's listening... Yeah, you're going to get all my guts. This is it. This is the inside coming out. Yeah. You know? Um, and it's going to be framed out with this Laverta. And it's about storytelling. It's about energy. And my hope is maybe it inspires you to chase your dream. Help you tell a better story. Joe, you're absolutely on it. You know, guys who do stuff, tell a good story. Come on, people. Let's tell a good story. We'll put links in the show notes yeah. to everything so you can find everything there. Yeah. And uh, you guys have a great week. Tell a better and, story. And find a way to get involved with it. There Especially you if you're resonating with like, maybe you're not telling the best story right now. Yeah. Get involved in a story. Get or involved in a home. story. Maybe you'll find what your home is. Yeah. Somewhere along Well, the find way. me on social media. I mean, N-E-A-L-E-B-A-Y-L-Y. Google search. Them. I'm like Tigger. I'm the only one. Yeah. Right? It's I the only spelling me. of Bailey. Yeah. I mean, tell me, this, <laughs> tell me your story. I mean, yeah. people, people do send me great stories every day. I mean, yeah. yeah, why not? Why not be inspired? Let's tell our story. Let's improve our story. Yeah. Let's have substantial conversations. We love making this stuff for you. You can help us out by subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. Get unstuck, tell a better story, and have a good answer to the question, what are you doing today?